Hello, everyone. So I work on collective animal behavior. And you may have seen footage like this, schooling fish or flocking birds. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is how insights from these systems have actually led me to start studying what's going on within the neural collective inside individuals' brains. And in particular, to ask questions about how do animals represent space and time? And so there's a fundamental question that almost all animals face, that they have to make decisions on the move. And yet we couldn't find any data at all of people recording the trajectories of animals when they make decisions. Yet in our model of how the brain should process this information, it's an embodied process where the geometry of the problem informs the neural uh, coding, which then changes the motion of the animal, which changes the geometry, which changes the neural representation, and so on, in an embodied process. And it predicts that there's a bifurcation in terms of dynamical systems theory that results in a physical bifurcation in space-time. Now, that's kind of cool to sort of think of something new about how animals move through space. But whenever we see a bifurcation, there's also a universal property, which is that these systems, whether it's an ecosystem or the brain, exhibits a spike in what's called susceptibility. What this means is that the brain becomes, as an emergent property, ultra sensitive to any differences between the options. And this comes for free. We didn't build it into the model. Furthermore, most uh, neuroscience or psychology work is done with two options because the models don't scale well to mo uh, beyond two options. We found that in our theory, animals will break down the complexity of the world into a series of repeated bifurcations. And at each bifurcation, they're amplifying as an emergent property the differences between the remaining options to make highly effective decisions, even with very small, noisy brains. Well, when you have ultra-sensitivity or bifurcations, and we want to find experimental evidence for that, it's very hard due to that ultra-sensitivity. So we invented immersive virtual reality for animals that allows us really to understand and control uh, the physics of the problem. Because we discovered, for example, that they don't represent space in a Euclidean way. So here you're seeing a zebrafish that believes another fish to be swimming in the tank with it, yet this is just light. This is just the anamorphic illusion. Now, one problem with this is because we have to project the scene precisely for the eyes of one individual, we can't put more than one into each of these virtual reality arenas. But what we do is we network them together so the individual in the nearmost tank can interact with a real-time hologram of the individual in the second or the third, and we're building 15 of these at the moment. And it's quite appropriate that we call this the matrix in this particular venue. And so here you're seeing two fish not interacting in the same physical world, or four fish, but interacting in the same holographic or virtual world. And of course, we can have avatars in there and we can control anything we like. So we use this type of virtual reality to test with fruit flies in a flying environment, with swarm-forming locusts in a terrestrial environment, and in zebrafish, as I mentioned, in the aquatic environment. So two invertebrate brains and one vertebrate brain, so widely evolutionary divergent. And we showed that, as predicted, their brains exhibit this bifurcation. We can see this clear branching. We tested this for two options and also for three options. And as predicted, we see this double bifurcation. And this is including in schooling in swimming fish. So we think this is a general feature. And what's more, this principle of geometric decision-making amplifies the accuracy by around 35%. And we think this is a really general feature in addition to time taken to make decisions and so on that we already knew about. And we've also been able to show that this same algorithm also works within animal groups. So even though the interactions are wildly different, there's a fundamental principle of spatiotemporal computation that extends from the brain to animal collectives. And we've even been able to test this with, you know, the results are so robust, we were able, able to test this in wild baboons in Kenya. And uh, we also now are showing that this is a very effective algorithm and can be very easily implemented into robotic applications. And so this is work that we're about to submit for publication. And finally, working with Armand Ball, we now have a preparation where the zebrafish in the virtual reality, we can actually see and record from every neuron in the brain. 
And as the animal passes commands to its body, we decode those. So if it wants to turn left or turn right, it does so in that virtual environment. And it can interact freely with the other animals in the next door lab within their virtual environments. And thanks very much for listening.